What's going on, everyone? In today's video, I have the man, the myth, the legend. This guy is on the Mount Rushmore of selling books on Amazon. And if you're in the book game, you know who his name is. This is Caleb Roth. And dude, this guy's made so many insane contributions to the community, whether it's teaching you how to read Keepograph or selling books on Amazon or like, you know, all these software companies like eFlip, which is an online book arbitrage software or Scout IQ, Pod IQ. I mean, there's literally so many contributions that Caleb Roth has made. And you know, he doesn't know this, but he's literally been my mentor since 2015, 2016 behind the scenes because I literally learned how to sell books on Amazon because of him, how to read, keep it charts, like all that stuff. So Caleb, thank you so much for being here. This is really like a holy grail moment for me in the channel. So I really do appreciate it. That's awesome. I can, I can hear the emotion in your voice. So I'm excited to be here. Uh, we've connected a little bit over the last few months and yep. been kind of keeping a, keeping a stealth eye on you. So I'm excited for the conversation. Sounds good. So People who are very entrepreneurial like yourself, right? They build these companies, but a lot of things you don't see in the beginning, these other business ideas that they had when they were kids or when they were younger. Um, you know, I'm curious for you, what were some of the things that you were doing when, you know, kind of pre-selling books that maybe a lot of people don't know about? Uh, Pre-book, that's a good question. Uh, I did probably some of the general things that a lot of kids did, uh, at least entrepreneurial kids, maybe not normal kids, <laughs> uh, but we did car washes. So I have a twin brother. Uh, and I'm mm -hmm. the younger of the twins. Uh, he came out first and I heard a lot of screaming and I said, heck no, and uh, <laughs> waited around. So I'm the younger of a twin. And then I have a brother 18 months younger. Um, and uh, they're both incredibly smart. They both work for Google right now. One of them, wow. Alpha Scout IQ, did a lot of our database mining and architecture initially. So we had three of us. We were always getting into trouble. We did car washes. We actually flipped books. We did eBay back before, huh. you know, way before Amazon was really a big thing. So that was kind of a, a, a summer quest to go find stuff to flip. We did like bake sales. I had a uh, cappuccino machine in my dorm room that I sold. I had a vending machine in my dorm room. So I was always flipping something. That's so cool. Now, I know that you end up majoring in business administration from Grace College. And I think a lot of the talk today is the value of college education. Is it worth the ROI, the return on investment? So I'm curious as someone who's actually got a business administration degree and also has run these other businesses, to what extent do you agree with that sentiment that you learn way more in the actual doing versus like the theory of actually learning in school? Uh, I think they're both important, but I think doing is far more important. I, I would say I, I'm I'm not sure where I land on the college debate. I know it's uh, it's coming under a lot more scrutiny. I know colleges are coming under a lot of challenges. Uh, actually, a lot of colleges were going out of business 2018, 19, 20. COVID actually slowed that because the government was passing out candy and money like it was candy, printing money. And so a lot of colleges took the PPP funds. They took a lot of other government funding. And so it actually artificially propped up schools. So I think we're going to see schools continue to come under pressure and continue to drop out. There's actually a, about a 10% drop off in the number of students that are going to be wow. entering about 2025, 26. Right. So the last recession, probably before you were born, Joji, but uh, 2000, <laughs> just kidding, 2008, yeah. uh, people actually stopped having kids. There's about a 10% drop off in kids. Um, wow. And add 18 years to that puts us at 2026, which not that far in the future. Wow. So do you need to go to college? Absolutely not. Should you go to college? It's, it's really a personal decision. And I think you get out of it what you put into it. Uh, what I mean by that is the same thing as going to a conference or joining a mastermind. Um, if you, there's, you can always sit there on the sidelines and say, nope, not worth it. I don't need to do it. Or you can say, hey, I see value. I'm going to pony up my time, my money, my attention, and I'm going to create value. I'm going to make it worth it. So college can be worth it. Uh, I have some great mentors, good friends of mine. Uh, I don't know if I have any business partners from college, but I definitely stay in touch with a lot of people there. Um, and so I've been fortunate to have that, but I was also uh, uh, eager enough to go track that down. So cool. I put a lot into college and I got a lot back out. Do you need it to be an entrepreneur? Absolutely not. Cool. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the eBay book flipping game back in college. Because for a lot of the newbies, I would even consider myself a newbie bookseller because, I mean, you started posting content, you know, so long ago. You started flipping books on eBay pre-Scout IQ, obviously, because you're the creator of Scout IQ. So can you take us back to some of those earlier challenges with flipping books online when you didn't have software to tell you green or red, like this is a book you should buy? Well, back then you could pretty much buy nearly any book and it would work out. So my brother and I actually wrote what may have been the first scouting tool back in 2004. Okay. So wow. That was a, I would have been 16. 
Um, we were going to thrift stores. We were going to uh, mostly garage sales. We were fortunate. We had two phone lines. Dad had an extra phone line for work. This was back in the days of dial up. And so we could actually, uh, and, and flip phones were just barely a thing. So we could go to garage sales. And what we usually did is I didn't have a car. I'd ride to a garage sale. I'd write down anything that looked interesting. So anything with a brand name, uh, it could be like a, I remember selling a bunch of Polaroid lands, SX 70 Polaroid cameras. Cool. You could pick those things up for, you know, two to $5 and flip them for 80 to a hundred. Um, so you, you started to learn, but all you did was just write down any brand name model number and the price, and then ride your bike back home, look it up on eBay <laughs> and look at comps, ride back to the sale and, you know, buy what you wanted to. So there was a lot more research involved. Uh, we started using phones a little bit, but we actually settled on books because they all have pretty much all have barcodes and ISBNs. Uh, as a cyclist, I could carry, you know, six, eight, 10 of them at a time in a backpack. They do get heavy, but at least it's something you can do and they're durable. So we wrote a scouting tool back then just as kind of a, let's, let's test it out. And all it was, was you would text the ISBN to an email address. Mm-hmm. That email address would be waiting for it. It would query it off. I'm pretty sure it went to Amazon. I don't think it was eBay. I think it was Amazon. We pull back sales rank, the lowest price, uh, and that might have been it. That's probably all you needed at the time. Yeah, and it that would then Crazy. send those results back to the email address, which would forward it back to the cell phone. So the whole round trip probably took fifteen to twenty seconds, and it seemed you know it seemed like cheating because we'd go to thrift stores and type it in. There was no barcode scanners. You couldn't use your phone's camera. That really wasn't a thing yet either. Um, so we kind of gravitated to books and it, it was much easier to sell a lot less competition, but we didn't really know what we had. Yeah. Um, and so we just kind of, it was a fun, you know, summer project. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. Um, but next question for you is, you know, it seems like you, in terms of building your businesses, you really like the consignment model. You really like the wholesale model. So those don't know consignment is, Hey, I'll sell your books for you. We'll split the profits. Wholesale is like, if I can find this book for a certain price point, I can sell to somebody else for a guaranteed price point and make money that way. So, you know, of those, you know, I think for most of the people who are in the book selling game, they don't do any of those. Like they literally just try to find books and then resell them on Amazon. So kind of what was the reason why you stumbled across those as being the foundational pieces of your business for selling on Amazon? Well, consignment started in college. I was selling textbooks for my friends and, you know, the bookstore, uh, did you go to college, Joji? I don't. Yeah, I did. I went to UC Riverside and uh, took my bachelor's, and I got a master's of education at UC San Diego. So I've got a master's degree. Yeah, nice. More uh, more educated than me. I'm turning my fan off. Hopefully that'll. that'll I read a little more educated on paper, but I can tell you guys, I was not writing code or software when I was in high school. I can tell you, I've that. I've not written a lick of code. I'm not a programmer. <laughs> uh, I just know how to coerce others into doing my my bidding. There you go. Maybe even a more valuable skill, right? Uh, I think so. I, I keep yeah. being tempted to learn how to code and then just realize it's it's really not the highest and best use of my time. Right. Um, so I did consignment in college for uh, other students. If mm-hmm. you've been to college, uh, those that are going to college, there's a little big sticker shock from the, the bookstore, obviously, on textbooks. And I just, you know, the bookstore would pay $10 for a book and it was selling for 80 on Amazon. And so I told the students, hey, don't don't sell it back to the bookstore. They're going to rip you off. I'll sell it for you. Um, just give me the book. I would track it on a spreadsheet because that's what I do. Uh, I do it on consignment. So I wouldn't buy the book. I didn't have a lot of money back then. I probably had a few hundred bucks to my name. And so I wouldn't, I didn't have, couldn't take the risk. So I would take the book and sell it on consignment. If it's sold, I'd drop it off at the post office. And then I would cut the uh, students a check or we didn't even have Venmo back then. I don't know how we survived, but uh, I under undervalued myself. I only took 10%. That's, uh, I can't uh, believe that's so low. Well, yeah. But for me, you know, free money. Minimum wage back then was like six dollars, right? And so, if I could sell a book for a hundred dollars, I think I was taking ten percent of gross potentially. So I'd make ten dollars, which is essentially like two hours worth of work for something that would take me, you know, less than ten minutes to, you know, wow. run it over to the post office and everything. That's awesome. Yo, so one thing that we've learned a lot about um, in like Avery's book selling uh, boot camps is the power of building relationships, right? Relationships are key. I'm curious, uh, what's kind of been your best advice for, or what would be like your best uh, tactics or advice for approaching maybe like a library or a thrift store, getting backroom access? Because clearly, you know, with, with your own business, like you've been able to build consignment relationships. So like what's the best sort of strategy or tactics for developing those key relationships? Just, just keep asking. Uh, try and provide value. And and I didn't finish the arc of the consignment question. Okay, so sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to get good that you're continuing on that path. 
So consignment for me was a way to, to sell books without having to pay for books up front. Uh, right. People had to trust me, of course, but once you start doing it, they, they trust it and they don't want to figure out Amazon anyway. Yeah. What I realized as I started flipping books was like, it's fine, but inevitably you're trading time for money. You're going to the mm-hmm. thrift stores, you're scanning the books, you're listing the books, you're, you're, you know, we outsource the, the prep or the, you know, the, the actual fulfillment to Amazon through FBA, but you still had to touch all the books. And so it was right. good money for your time, but it was still your time for money. And so one of the things that appealed to me was how do I get books to show up at my door that I didn't have to go find? Yeah. And what I started with was a scout team. I tried to hire other people and, and that, you know, struggled for a number of reasons. I think we had scouts working for us in eight or 10 states at one point. Wow. So we kind of had a, a pretty decent distributed model, but it was just hard to find good people and it was hard to train them and it was hard to, to keep that going. So consignment always appealed to me because we could just go directly to the sources and say, hey, if you're going to run a library sale, why don't you just scan everything with our tool at first? Um, we'll pay you, you know, we'll either sell it on consignment and split 50-50 or we'll just pay you $2 a book or $3, right. whatever we had to do. Um, and all your employees have to do is scan. It'll just turn green or red. And so we right. built a basic web version of Scout IQ back before we, you know, had Palette IQ and it just turned green and red. It was very, very simple. Right. And so the pitch was go in and say, hey, we can help you make more money for your books. The pitch eventually was, you know, you have to get to know the, the client. So you have to right. say, hey, um, you know, what what do you want? What do you care about? And usually it's money or it's getting rid of all my books because right. they have they have way too many. So if the answer is I need to get rid of my books, then you need to be prepared to come in and take all the books off their hands. Right. Typically, you can do that for free or very, very uh, inexpensively. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to have to deal with the duds and go through all that. And so I, my pitch was, hey, if you care about money, we can help you out. We can, we can you know, turn your donated and discarded books into cash. So that was the pitch. The, our first library was, was Grace College. It's where I went to school. And uh, I went in and asked the, the librarian, hey, we can help sell these for you. And she goes, yeah, that's cool. But we, we'll just sell them at our sale for you know, $2. Fine. I'll come and buy your book. So I bought I think I bought over 500 books. They had a really big weeding pro- project. Okay. And so I uh-huh. think I bought something like, it might've been closer to a thousand. I think it was over $20,000 of list price. Wow. And okay. And I paid them like $2,000. And so I went and showed the numbers a few months later and said, hey, I probably shouldn't show you this, but I've made you know eight grand or 10 grand or something uh, profit off of your sale. I would love to do consignment. I'm moving to Colorado. Is this something you would consider? And they eventually... Right. You know, she, she said no again. I approached her a few months later. She said no again. And then finally she called me and said, Hey, we're doing another big weeding project. Tell me more about this. Wow. That's so cool. So it just seems like, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. You're in, you're in because you told tons of other colleges about us. And it's sort of the uh, cart before the horse thing. When you try and get your first job, they want you to have five years experience. Well, right. Or jobs don't have experience. So someone has to take a risk. Um, Grace took a risk on us. And once we were up and running, then it was way easier to land the next client and the next one because we had proof. Hey, Grace College trusts us. Here's what we paid them. Here's what the process okay. looks like. Call them if you have any questions so they could fact check you. And then it just grew from there. That's so cool. So it seems like just persevering and building that track record and just keep asking, right? I mean, and, and just ultimately adding value by solving a problem, right? So very- oh, we did a number of things. The other thing is we... we asked for their, uh, they were trying to figure out their value, their collection for insurance purposes. And so I said, Hey, oh, wow. do you have a list of ISBN? She goes, yeah. So it was like 110,000 books. And so we ran that through Amazon's API, returned all the values and said, here's the value of your library. Wow. I also harvested that data and that became part of the backbone for our initial Scout IQ database. Wow. So, you know, we were all just trying to help and get to know right. them and show some interest. And then the other thing we did is I didn't have any clients, but I had examples of, hey, I've sourced from this Goodwill or this thrift store, or this library sale. Right. So I was able to take a printout of that and say, hey, here's our program, made a nice looking you know, pamphlet, put it in a nice right. folder and had like I put a logo in it. You don't need all that stuff, but it does help show that you're serious about what you're doing. So yeah. all of those things were here's the program, here's what we can do, here's how we'll pay you, here's how often we'll pay you. And here's some examples of sources that, you know, they're not consignment sources, but here's some examples of sources that we've worked with, i.e. the local Goodwill. Yeah. Uh, and so all of that together just kind of helps keep proof, prove what you are. Yeah, that's so cool. And 
another aspect of this was you had a full-time job at the time. So I know you worked in orthopedics. I don't remember exactly what, what it is that you had done, but I know that you had a very well-paying job, very respected job. I know you said you didn't see yourself working that job for many, many years, but for somebody on the cusp of that, you know, they see this, this opportunity that could potentially be golden, but also is inherently very risky. What are some of the tips you have now having gone through that process of deciding to leave a cushy full-time, I don't know if it's cushy, but a nice full-time job to transition to a business venture like that? Uh, it was a pretty good job. It was, uh, I, I did marketing, I did product management, product okay. support, uh, and ended up doing a little bit of sales training um, for, for Johnson & Johnson. So it was, it was, it was a great company, great right. products, great team. Uh, I got the travel, I got paid to, you know, wine and dine surgeons, which was pretty nice. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was a good job. The benefit of doing that, like I've, I've heard great success stories of people that, you know, lost their job and they didn't have any other option. They just had to jump in and right. trust themselves and, and become an entrepreneur and they were forced into it. I had the, the luxury of not jumping into the deep end. I got to sort of step slowly into the kiddie pool. Gotcha. Uh, and so I was able to have a side hustle, start building it up, building it up, and eventually knowing that, all right, this is starting to get traction. This is working. And it, it is extra work. I worked a full-time job and then was throwing an, an additional 10, 15, 20 hours a week toward this silly, you know, book flipping side gig. But eventually got some traction. Um, and, you know, just like you, we, we talked about personal finance, but right. we were able to keep our expenses uh, much lower than our income. So I wasn't trying to replace my income from the cushy job. I was trying to replace my expenses. So it was a, right. a lot easier task to go after that number. And as we got close to that, I knew that if at that point, if I quit and went full time, it, it was very doable. Very cool. So at some point in this transition, the YouTube channel came along the book in the book flipping community. I'm curious, what was the origin of that channel? Was it more of like, hey, we were starting to develop develop this software and this was kind of like a strategy to market this? Or is it kind of just more like an organic thing that kind of just developed from your own interest in trying to learn how to sell books and teach people how to do it? I wish I could say we were playing the long game from day one, but it, it was really just a way to say, hey, entrepreneurship is lonely. Uh, I don't have the coworkers that I'm drinking coffee with every day. People don't, you know, take it seriously. I used to hate, it was like this game I played. I'd, I'd be flying somewhere and sit next to somebody and they go, what do you do? And I go, for books on, on the internet. Yeah. Like, what kind of books? I'm like, paper books. Like, they should book people read. Like, I don't know. What, what do you want me to say? And yeah. like the conversation would quickly end. They're like, that's the thing? Okay, cool. Yeah. So it didn't sound very, very sexy. And it, it was definitely a lonely uh, endeavor. The communities have really popped up, but there weren't yep. as many. I think Husha Moore and I forget who, I think a guy named Bob ran a Facebook group. And that was about the only thing for book flippers. And I think wow. that group is still going. So wow. that was, that was, uh, that was kind of a community. I just built the blog because I saw a lot of misinformation. And I thought, hey, if we can, if I could throw some stuff up there and talk about sales rank and talk about, you know, kind of busting some of the myths as it relates to flipping books, I thought that'd just be cool. So all I did is I would just write articles based on, you know, questions I would see pop up in the groups. And someone would say, hey, sit books with a sales rank over a million, don't buy them, they never sell. And I would say, well, hey, 40% of my sales come from books ranked over a million. Here's the numbers. Here's why, here's what rank means. Here's how, you know, to make better decisions. And I would just, you know, post, put that out there. And then people started sharing it. Someone else would say, hey, you know, I've heard books over a million don't sell. And they go, well, hey, check out the bookflipper.com. Here's a post. They would post for me. So they were spamming the groups for me, which when it's not me doing it, it's totally acceptable. Right. And so the, the, the page, the blog started growing. Then I was like, well, shoot, I probably should capture email addresses, probably should right. turn this into something real. And then when we decided to go after the software space, it made it a lot easier because we already had an audience. We already had an email list. Right. That's fascinating. So many people get started uh, selling on Amazon in the book game because inherently the startup costs are so low, but yet a lot of people end up transitioning out of books once they get, gather some capital. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the space, but a lot of people are going to traditional OA, even wholesale private label. Do you think those are, are better long-term FBA business models now? And kind of why did you not decide to venture into those? I think there's... There's a thousand ways you can make money. That's what <laughs> Parker Matthew and I used to joke about. We said, you can make money doing anything. And I, I firmly believe that. There's a lot of benefits. I actually watched a, an Alex Hormozzi video today um, mm -hmm. about just doing one thing and going all in. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something to be said for that. Uh, we love to have multiple streams of income. I like to chase shiny and start all kinds of new things. Uh, but the reality is you get the best benefits when you go all in and keep doing the same thing. 
because you get better, you, you understand the problems more intimately, people start coming to you um, for help. And so if you're able to, and the longer you do something, I think you can for sure figure out a way to grow that exponentially. Um, just like in personal finance, you don't get returns, you know, exponential returns take a while. But uh, once you're building on layering on top of you know, all of your experience, some, sometimes that hockey stick can occur. Now, that said, I've seen other people just go absolutely crazy in wholesale and retail arbitrage and private label. And yeah, you can certainly make a run at any of those business models. I think they're fantastic. I do think that books can be a little challenging. I know you're doing a lot of online arbitrage. Right. But if you live in a small town, small market, you're not able to drive very far and go look for books at thrift stores, estate sales, et cetera. You might right. be limited into how big you can grow it if you don't want to do online arbitrage. So. Right. I think books are a fantastic way to start out. Uh, kind of said it was the gateway drug into selling on Amazon or just flipping in general. So I think it's a great way to get started. You can certainly then add other products or you know branch into different business models. Yeah, but I'm curious products. if you ever. I'm curious if you ever heard of the book called The Pumpkin Plan by Mike Michalowicz. I, have, I love yeah. Mike Michalowicz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you read that book? I have. Oh yeah, there, I, I actually that's probably my favorite book that he's written. But uh, I just that was just a side note. Kind of what you explained was almost like right on par with what. What do you say? So I don't think there's any any issue to, you know, everything that you do in business or in life uh, to some extent can be renegotiated. So if you say, hey, I'm trying to learn how to, you know, sell books, you don't have to be locked in, into that mindset. Now, one of the things when I launched my blog, it was the bookflipper.com. I sort of painted myself into a corner. So it would have been hard to switch. Say, hey, I'm going to start doing other things. They're like, yeah, but you, you're, you're the book flipper. So, right. you know, start a little more generic. Um, but every time I got tempted to look at other things and I have tried a number of other things too on Amazon and outside of Amazon, I just kept going, all right, what's the highest and best use of my time? And right. you know, if it's, if I just need a diversion or a distraction, cool, it, own up to it, go try something else, see if it takes off. Um, but usually if I was going to go spend an extra 10 hours a week and throw it towards something, it was best spent in the book. Right. Awesome. But yeah. that said, I did branch out of books. I got into software. Right. So, that is true. And actually, that, that's my next question here. So you yeah. built Scout IQ, uh, Pallet IQ, eFlip. Uh, those are some of the, uh, those are the softwares that you built. I'm curious, what were some of the other software ideas that you had that maybe didn't come to fruition or that people don't know about, if there are any? Uh, we also had New Price. That was uh, Matthew originally. And then we pulled that under the uh, the IQ brand. So that was a repricing software. Okay. Uh, I was an angel investor at Acceler List. So we did some listing. That's right. Yeah. Um, that would be, uh, so that's something else. I I built a few other like side tools, mostly just for myself. Uh, we would flip to wholesalers. So we would mine a list. We'd take a list of books. We would run it through our, our analyzer and then find them cheaper on Amazon. And then we redid the same thing. There's probably some validity here. I know Steve Rakin's doing something similar now, but we built a tool where you could upload a list of uh, ISBNs or UPCs and it would then uh, look on eBay and yeah. analyze every new item that was put on eBay in those categories. Right. And it would take those prices and say, hey, you're willing to pay $15 or the Amazon price is you know, $80. You can pick it up on eBay for $25. Do you want to you know, take a closer look? So yeah. I think there's definitely some uh, arbitrage opportunities between eBay and Amazon. And uh, those projects never saw the light of day. Yeah, interesting. Um, let's go back to the importance of relationships. You know, what were some of the, you know, thinking back, what are maybe one or two key relationships that you can think of that completely just transform your business, whether that could be, you know, selling on Amazon specifically, or maybe getting into, you know, the, the, the app space and stuff like that. Oh, uh, the first one that comes to mind was uh, a bookstore manager. He was a, a college friend of mine. So again, you get what out of college, what you put into it. He was another business major. I think he was at least a year, maybe two years younger. We could be the same age though. So don't, don't tell him I said that, right. but uh, it was a friend of mine. He worked at the bookstore and I knew they had a buyback list. You know, you go in there and you'd scan a, a textbook and they'd offer you 12 bucks, 15 bucks, whatever. And I said, Hey, do you guys have a, like a hard copy of that list or a spreadsheet or something I can get my hands on? I just want to poke around and see if I could find those books cheaper elsewhere, other platforms uh, right. from college professors, whatever. And, uh, he said, you know, he, he was kind enough to show me the ropes, walk me through how that model worked. He goes, look, I, I could, I could probably track down a list through Nebraska Book Company, which is a company we did uh, business with for almost 10 years till they went out of business about four months ago. Uh, <laughs> so they were in business over a hundred years. Uh, so we, we uh, I had some good relationships there and 
feel bad for everybody there as they they just kind of suddenly closed up doors. Yeah. So that was a, a relationship with the bookstore manager that opened the door to an entire world I had no idea existed. And we stayed close over the years, and he's actually still working in the industry for uh, one of the bigger players, actually. So it was really fun to just compare notes. Every time we heard rumors in the industry, we'd, we'd call each other, catch up. So that that relationship was was awesome. He's still a good friend, and uh, you know that that just opened opened doors because I was curious, and he was kind enough to share with me. Yeah. Um, others would be adding our team. You know, finding Cole, which was our developer. Joseph took a risk. My little brother Matthew. We met at a breakfast. Uh, David, someone else connected us locally. We were both living in Denver. So the team just continued to grow and, and all of those relationships, we we would never have done what we did without each and every one of them. Very cool. Now, uh, one of the more scarier aspects of selling books, specifically textbooks, is the counterfeit likelihood. I mean, there are, as you know, quite a few counterfeit textbooks out there for good reason. And when I say that, whenever you have something that's valuable or worth a lot of money, there's potential opportunity, right, for someone to arbitrage the space a little bit differently, which, you know, making fake products. I myself had my account suspended in 2021. I'm sure you're very familiar with kind of the layout and the story. I, I was test bought out by a, a law firm, three copies that were deemed counterfeit, got my account suspended, had to write a plan of action. It's kind of an entire mess and really showed me that I'm at the mercy of Amazon. Amazon literally owns everything, right? At any time I can be shut down. I'm curious, you having your position and your connections being behind the scenes with, you know, Scout IQ and all the people that you know, was there anything else behind the scenes that you might be able to share or share or willing to share of like kind of how that all played out and how things like that have gone? Uh, I have a number of stories I can't share, unfortunately. Um, okay. I, I, you know, I know some, uh, basically I, I know a lot of the same things that are out there. I, I've talked to a lot more people so can kind of connect some dots. I did have a conversation with the law firm, kind of was asking, inquiring into what they were after, what they were doing. Um, and we we made an ask on Scout IQ's behalf to get a list of the books that they knew were counterfeit, oh, just okay. because we wanted to flag those back before Amazon told you if you were restricted or not. Right. We wanted to just flag those books and let people know, hey, there are counterfeit books. This yeah. this ISBN is not guaranteed to be counterfeit, but there are known yeah. counterfeit out there. Right. If you just want to steer clear and stay far away, you, you could probably avoid this book, right? And uh, they politely declined. Um, after which I accused them of not actually wanting to help weed out counterfeits. So that got a little heated, but yeah, our, our account got, um, we never got suspended. It was before that, but we definitely got flagged for counterfeits. One of the business models I tried was, uh, one of those buyback companies on bookscouter.com. We actually partnered with one of them. So we were providing data for making better decisions in terms of what to purchase. And then right. they were selling a lot of the books back through our account. So that was, uh, that was pretty nice. We ran a couple hundred thousand dollars of textbooks back through our account. Wow. Uh, unfortunately, many of those I'm sure were counterfeit. We never touched them. You know, they were listed into our account. Um, so we definitely got hit. They said they had something like 72 violations tied to either my account or through wholesale activity. And again, wow. I've flipped hundreds of thousands of, of books wholesale. So okay. I don't doubt it, but you know, that's a big number, but they never, never come and said anything. They, what they tried to do, they did take some booksellers to court. They did kind of ask, you know, haphazardly, like, hey, how do you want to settle this cash or cash or card? So they're <laughs> talking about, I said, I'm not talking to you, you know, is this a formal anything? And it never went anywhere. Uh, we're past the statute of limitations now. But what they were trying to do is extort, you know, a thousand to two thousand dollars per title and yeah. try and say, hey, you, you willingly sold a counterfeit. It's like, well, we, one, I didn't willingly sell it to prove it's counterfeit, you know? Right. Uh, I had heard stories from other industry players that I can't disclose, but they bought brand new textbooks from the publishers, Cengage, Pearson, McMillan, you know, the, the major publishers for textbooks and didn't even open them up, bought them brand new, like from the source, got them sent in, sent them to the law firm and said, Hey, we've set these aside. Can you just inspect and, and let us know if they're counterfeit? And something like 25% of those books came back and they said, yeah, they're counterfeit. Well, that's they're literally crazy. coming from the publisher. So wow. either there's counterfeits that the publishers are willingly putting into, which I don't necessarily believe that that conspiracy theory, although it would be cool. <laughs> or there's not that great of a way to tell if it's counterfeit. Right. So I don't know. It's definitely an issue. I know Avery's going through some shutdown stuff right now. It's his birthday. So happy birthday, Avery, whenever yeah. this goes live. But yeah, um, yeah, it is an issue. I think it's something to, you know, you try and protect yourself and figure out how to tell if a book's counterfeit. The reality is, yeah, you should. I think stopcounterfeitbooks.com is still a, a pretty good resource. Right. That site's still up and running. It's been a little bit. But 
it, the nice part is most newer sellers are restricted yeah. from selling what's called popular textbooks. Right. And so most of those counterfeit books are going to be under that category, which yeah. is actually, it stinks. You can't sell them on Amazon. You can sell them elsewhere. Um, but that's kind of a red flag of, hey, these potentially are counterfeit. And so most newer sellers can just kind of steer clear. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people who come to my channel as well, they're like, I can't sell any of these books. And I, I tell them, like, it's actually a saving grace. It's actually a good thing. Cause if you go through the getting your account suspended, it's actually like a nightmare. So yeah, I try to tell them, like, you know, be happy. I mean, kind of hard to tell someone to be happy that they can't sell something. But in this case, I think you know, not being able to sell those is actually a good thing. But I really appreciate that story. That's uh, fascinating. And Super, super valuable. Yeah, it is a blessing in disguise. You can sell those on eBay. The law firm does do test purchases on eBay, so you can still get some issues there. Yeah, Don't know if they can connect your eBay account to your Amazon account. Um, right. the, the unfortunate reality is like Amazon, there's enough third-party sellers now. Something like 65% of all of Amazon sales come from third-party sellers like you and me. Um, and so they have enough of us. We're sort of expendable. And if they decide to just you know, kick us to the curb, they can't. You know, so it's an unfortunate reality. Yeah. So that brings me to my next question. I learned very quickly that Amazon, like I'm at the mercy of Amazon. Amazon owns my inventory. I think when I got suspended, they held like a $7,000 paycheck for months. Didn't see that for, for many months later on. It brings me back to kind of the personal finance topic as well, which I know you're very interested in. I know that you always advocate for diversification. So could you explain a little, I, I know that you've also got into, you know, investing in bourbon, which is something that would it traditionally be seen as like, you know, uh, real estate or stocks or something like that? So can you talk to us a little bit about your sort of personal finance uh, tips with with diversifying and not having all of your eggs in one basket with Amazon? Well, so this is not my opinion. I, I know a lot of really smart people say it. So you typically make your money by becoming really good at one thing. So going deep down the rabbit hole, that's when you get your exponential gain. That's when That's when, you know, you typically make your money. So most people make their money by doing one thing incredibly well, building a business, uh, investing in lots of real estate, whatever it might be. Uh, and then once they have a good chunk of money, then it becomes all about diversification because at that point you have something to lose. And it's really fascinating. Um, when you don't have a lot of money, you're not too concerned. Like it stinks. You have pressure and stress. But right. I've talked to a handful of people that have sold businesses um, and I feel some of the pressure myself. But once you have the money, you stop playing offense and you're starting to play defense now. And that's just a very different mental challenge. Again, it's a first world problem. It, it's, it's a good problem to have. But when you're no longer playing offense, saying, how do I grow this business? And now it's all about how do I avoid losing? It, it becomes a, a different game. So I made my money in software, made my money in books. You know, all, all both of those were connected. Um, and now I've got some money, not, you know, not stupid money, but really good money. And the question yeah. now is, how do I put that to work? And how can I find passive investments or just regular investments in general that could pay for my living expenses? And if I can do that, just like the uh, the fire movement, then I I can be financially independent and I can retire early. So yeah. that's ultimately the goal is how do I put those dollars that I've earned, how do I put those soldiers to work now and try and yeah. make other soldiers as uh, one of the sharks so eloquently says. Yeah. You know, one of the advice, so for those who don't know, I'm also very interested in FIRE. So that stands for financial independence, retire early. Obviously, Caleb is at that point. Basically, it just means you're at the point where you wouldn't technically need to work anymore if you just were to stay at the same living expenses. One of the uh, comments that pe people from the outside always give people in the community is like, well, why do you, like, why would you want to retire early? Like, you're going to be bored. So you being on a little hiatus, being on a little sabbatical, I'm curious what your thoughts are having taken a few months off now. Are you actually bored? Not yet. I, I do have the itch to get back into something just because I do like to build. Uh, I really miss hanging out with David and Matthew regularly. So we we started meeting once a week, uh, connecting and, and working through a few ideas. So we're uh, you'll you'll see some stuff from us coming out soon. You know, uh, so let's we'll, we'll leave it at that. that. But um, I'm fortunate. I've had a number of things happen in the last year. You know, I sold the business, exited in December, stuck around for a little bit, helped with the transition. I've got a number of Airbnb investment properties. I've made some other investments uh, with some other firms. So I, I've kind of stayed busy. And then I got married in May, picked up four girls in the process. So I've got a son. I've got four girls. We got we moved. Uh, we went on a honeymoon. We just got back from camping. So yeah. The life doesn't slow down. You think it does a little bit. Uh, school's going to start. My son just started this week. The girls all start next week. Um, so yeah, life life does not really slow down. Yeah, that's so, so cool. 
yeah, you you can be bored. What I I read almost forty books in the first quarter of this year. Sheesh. So I mean, good. every day instead of working, I didn't have emails to answer. I would you know read books, hang out with kids, work on homeschool stuff. But yeah. it it's up to you just to keep study and keep yourself fresh. There's so much information out there. So I've been listening to a ton of podcasts, reading a bunch of books, meeting with people I respect, playing a little bit of golf because I I like that. Um, But ultimately, uh, I I don't worry about being bored. Yeah. So you decided obviously to sell, you know, Scout IQ, eFlip, Palette IQ. And I know having listened to some of the other interviews, you were kind of saying like, it wasn't necessarily your intention to sell it, but there was like a number where you're like, okay, if the number is there, I'm maybe willing to part ways. So I guess let's just, if you want to mind delving into, what was your kind of your mindset between figuring out that, okay, maybe there is a number I would be okay with exiting versus like, this is clearly something that's a big pumpkin that's working well for me. I can continue to not exploit it, but do really well in this in the future. Like how, how did you kind of navigate that? Yeah. So I actually, I was, I was to the point where I was ready to sell. It wasn't, okay. it wasn't really a number thing. Everybody does have a number. You're like, well, I never sell it. I believe it's going to keep growing. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, you know, is it worth a million dollars? No, I would never sell for that. Well, about a hundred million. Okay. Maybe. Right. <laughs> so everybody has a number. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean someone's going to pay you that number. It has right. to be willing buyer, willing seller. Um, I got to the point over the last two years before we sold it, where it was it was pretty much there. And again, we'd stop playing offense as much. We were fixing more bugs, trying to handle uh, scale problems, hiring new developers. There was just always something in the business. And we got to the point where it was it was harder and slower to work on new features. And we were having more fun working on the podcast. And I just, you know, for me, if once you're kind of bored with something, it becomes hard to just wake up every day and do that hard work. Right. And so it was super fun to create it to talk to customers, do the beta, roll it out, do the launch. And then once it was running, we, you know, kept adding features, kept, you know, investing in the community. But with COVID, the community stopped. We, we couldn't do our, our meetups. We couldn't do our turn the page conferences or scouting right. summits. And so it really just slowed everything up. We lost a good chunk of our business because our customers couldn't go source. Right. Um, and then fortunately, we went incredibly viral on TikTok with some of our, our customers out there. So that, right. that sort of saved us. And we were still good. We even even when we lost a ton of business, we were still profitable. Um, yeah, we didn't have to lay anybody off. We 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 run a really tight ship, and that really helped us stay stay good. I had researched about eighteen months prior to selling uh, the process of selling. I talked to people that had done it. I met with a broker. Uh, met with two two brokers actually. Kicked the tires. Talked to several firms, and like you know, kind of floated that we were interested, and nothing really came. Nobody really stepped forward. Uh, and then I assumed that private equity was drying up in, you know, toward the middle of last year. I didn't think it was going to be a potential for us to sell anymore. Right. So I knew that I was bored, that I was no longer growing the business. I was trying to defend it. And that's not where I want to be in life. Yeah. And so I had, you know, I kind of told my team, we either need to figure out a way to sell this thing, which I don't think there's any buyers. We were wrong. <laughs> or we need to find a way to outsource it and hire someone else to be the face to run it, or maybe we'll still be the face, but someone else will run most of the day to day. And right. we need to, you know, find a way to step back from the business. So I right. thought we were going to have to do that. I didn't, you know, it was going to be a lot of work still to do that process, but I thought that's, that's what we were going to have to do. And then I got a, a, a cold reach out on LinkedIn that turned into a phone call that turned into a, an offer to buy the company. Wow. That's amazing. Now you talked about, you know, the, we talked about the importance of building relationships, obviously, you know, Matthew Osborne, David Chung came into your life really valuable, invaluable business partners. What are some, you know, one or two things from each of those guys that you learned that you just still take with you today? Oh man, well, we're going to, we're going to hopefully do some other things together. So the the ride isn't over, I hope. Okay. Yeah. Um, Matthew was someone who had already sold a business. He built an ammo subscription business on Instagram and oh, he sold it for $5,000-ish wow. and the buyer may have backed away or something like, but he went through that whole process. That's something I admired. He just put stuff into action. A um, couple things about Matthew. He's incredibly disciplined. He will wake up at 4.30 in the morning, go work out, like hike up a mountain, write his journal, beat his chest, meditate, whatever, and then you know come back down and get his day started. So I always look up to him. He's incredibly motivated. He's incredibly disciplined and, and wants to just improve himself all the time. So he's super fun to be around. He's also just very talented uh, at marketing, SEO, building websites, any of the stuff in the background that I don't love to do. I don't like doing the tactical work on websites. That's not where my gifts are. 
And so I was able to essentially, you know, we, we collaborate, but I outsource that to my business part. And so, you know, that freed me up to do more strategic things. Yeah. David is just a people person. He's incredible. He's such a good gift giver. He's very thoughtful. One of my favorite times from last year, we went to Austin and just, we went down, we were investing in a company together, just doing like a loan and looking if we wanted to invest further. And we just went down and got an Airbnb and just walked around, had coffee, nice dinners, met with local entrepreneurs and just talked about life. And that, that was probably, I think three days down in Austin. That was, that was easily one of my favorite memories of last year. That's right. um, so yeah, surround yourself with great people. David is, is amazing with people. He runs a great warehouse. If, if, if you ever get a chance to go to Denver, call him up, ask for a tour. Right. He, you know, he runs a tight ship. Um, and I'm just drawn to people that do things well. If yeah. you're curious about stuff and act well on it, I want to be your friend. That's so cool. Yeah, I actually had the pleasure to meet both of them uh, at Avery's event, the Miami Sellers Conference. And super bummed I wasn't able to meet you there as well. But yeah, I can, I can vouch at least from having had some, you know, smaller conversations with them, but awesome, really awesome guys. And was uh, super thankful to be able to, to talk to him. Now, earlier you mentioned you read 40 books. You said the first quarter of this year, I, I believe, maybe. I think, it was, I think it was 35 in the first three months. I've slowed down since, but. Yeah. So I think it's fascinating how we talk about selling books, right? That's the business model, but very few people actually talk about like the actual reading of the books, right? The content, the valuable information that comes inside them. Was there a book that really just kind of transform the business, whether that be, you know, the Amazon business, the way that you would operate, or even uh, some of the, the apps that you end up building? Yes. There's a lot of books that, uh, that would have took a lot of I would say the one thing uh, by Gary Keller and Jay Papazan was probably okay. the one that stuck out the most. Okay. Uh, it was just a way of thinking. And for those that if you don't want to read the book, or if you have, check out Tim Ferriss interviewed Gary Keller. So just, just Google, find it right now, but Tim Ferriss, Gary Keller, uh, he actually goes through the one thing principle and he explains it in a lot more detail outside of just business. Right. And in a nutshell, it, it is, it's a question you ask yourself, you go, what is the one thing I can do so that if I did it, everything else in my life becomes easier or unnecessary. So for him, he's like, when you apply that to your personal life is I come home from work, what's the one thing I can do so that everything else, you know, at, at home becomes easier and unnecessary for him. It's go find his wife and kiss her. Say, hey, I'm glad to see you. And that just yeah. makes the whole evening go better. Yeah. And so it's just a framework to like, all of us are just busy. I had a call with uh, Avery and Taylor today. We were just talking over like, what do you want to accomplish? You know, business, personally, professionally, uh, with health, with finance, whatever. And we, we're all busy. We all like to wear the badge of hustle. Uh, yeah. You know, we all want to work really hard, work, work a lot. But the reality is you have to figure out what you want, what you're aiming at. And if you can't figure that out, then it doesn't really matter what activities you do because you're not really, you know, aligning everything up else or up and going toward a centralized goal. Yeah. So figuring out what you want is very important. But the one thing was a, a phenomenal framework to to get there. So you you mentored a whole bunch of people. Like you just talked about, you know, Taylor and Avery. I know Avery specifically, you mentored, uh, you mentored probably literally thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people that you don't even know. I'm one of them, right? Like I got started because of you back in 2015, 2016. So no, obviously, I appreciate that so much. Um, I'm curious, has there been someone out there who's been a mentor for you? And kind of who is that person? And kind of what are those things that really help transform your business or just the way you think about you know, how to keep going forward? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, I would say everybody that I've mentored, ha- I've learned something from as well. So even okay. the conversation we had, and you were kind enough to send me a book, which it, I might to read pile, I haven't read it yet, but it's a very valuable Amazon book on on setting up you know family investments. So that's, yeah. uh, it's timely. So it's something I, I do care a lot about right now. So I appreciate that. It's one way to stand out. But anytime I talk to somebody, I'm picking up information from them. Uh, and the cool thing was all of the turn the page conferences we did, they were small you know, meetups. We'd have 30 to 50 booksellers there. And we'd bring in four to five speakers at every event. And I always told the speakers, I said, hey, you know, we, we're not making money on this. We'll pay for your flights, pay for your food, your lodging. We really can't pay you to be here, unfortunately. Right. Uh, we'll, we'll just make it worth your time. But I said, the reality is, you're going to, in the conversations that are out there, somebody is going to be in the weeds that's making, you know, 10 grand a month is going to be in there and, and they figured out something really cool. They, they dialed in repricing, they figured out a hack to do something really efficiently. And that, that's great. It's helping them at $10,000 save 5%. Well, right. you guys are doing half a million a month. And so you can take that same 5% improvement and they're saving $500 
you're going to save twenty five thousand dollars by implementing this 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 deal. Right. So uh, a lot of the bigger sellers, you know, it's like, well, they they don't have anything else to learn. The reality is, we're all learning every single day. And so if we can borrow ideas from other people or books or, you know, podcasts or whatever you get information from, you can apply those to your business and make it work. Right. So, yeah, I learn from people I mentored. I haven't had a lot of formal mentorships, but I okay. do I do grab people all the time, say, hey, let's go play golf. Hey, let me buy you right. dinner. Let's go grab coffee. And I'm asking them questions and trying to figure out how to manage people, uh, run a business, know when it's time to sell, all those questions. So I've, yeah. I've got, you know, professors from college friends locally, golf buddies from Denver, just anybody that's an entrepreneur or is managing a team or, you know, whatever stage of life they're in, I'm trying to learn, you know, how to be a better dad, how to be a better person, how to, you know, manage my finances. I'm, I'm trying to learn every chance I can get. Cool. Well, just remember, right, if you ever come to San Diego, California, you're not leaving without at least, you know, playing around golf. Of course, I'll pay for everything. I'll take you out to lunch because, dude, Obviously, you know, contribution you made for me is just, it, it's so invaluable and I obviously want to repay the favor, but I you know, would love that that opportunity as well. So if you're ever in San Diego, make sure uh, we're going to play Arrowwood Golf Course. Number 16, Island Green. I think you'll love it. Uh, I don't know how long you hit the ball, but anyways, it's like for me, I don't know. Really hit, I hit like maybe like 220, 230. So second shot is like a three wood. It's kind of like tin cup feeling. So I think you'll like it for sure. I, but if you're ever here, I, make sure you stop by. And actually segues into my next question. So you're an avid golfer. In golf, what gets the accolades is drive for show. And really, in reality, both of us know that puff for dough is what, what it comes down to, right? So do you think there is an analogy in the Amazon game where there's something that a lot of people really focus on and they ignore something that's smaller that's actually way more important? Yeah, uh, lots of things come to mind. Uh, one side note, I'll come back to it in a second, but I just logged that request to come play in San Diego. I'll explain why that matters in a second. Okay. Um, and I've already logged it before, but I, I, it just popped into my head again. Okay. So I'm doing it. I appreciate that request. I will yep. definitely take you up on it. I okay. am, I will be coming out there. I need to see a few people. I'll be coming out there in the next four to five months. So I will, awesome. I will definitely hit you up. Okay, awesome. All right, drive for show, putt for dough. For those that aren't golfers, drive for show. Everybody likes to say they can hit the ball 400 yards. You know, average tour pro does now. I think the average, you know, right. driving distance on, on tour is 299 yards or right at 300. Most amateurs can't hit it anywhere near that, even yep. if they say they can. But it's really impressive to stand up and just smack, just smoke yep. a drive, swing it, swing out of your shoes and just catch the sweet spot and rip one 250 to 300 yards. There's yep. probably no greater feeling. But the reality is in golf, every shot counts. It's a yeah. book, I think, by Mark Brody. Um, but every everything matters. So if you can hit a 300-yard drive and you know, you're know you playing with someone that only hits at 220, it looks embarrassing. You make all these jokes like, hey, do you hear about the new super center they're building in between our three balls? You know? So yeah. there, there's all kinds of, it feels good. But the reality is if you get up and miss a two-foot putt, that still counts as a stroke. And right. so if someone can pour in a 10-foot putt, you know, it's, a, it's an even match or they might beat you. And so where that applies to the Amazon business is, you know, drive for show is sales. It yep. doesn't matter what your sales are. I see so many people posting screenshots and, you know, 30K months and 100K months and million dollar months. That's all great. But what are your profits? So I would say driving is sales or the picture of all the books you bought. Like it's sexy. It looks good on Instagram, but show me the money. You know, yeah, sure. I didn't know is what are your actual profits? So do you know your expenses? Do you know what it costs to, you know, personally to be you, but in your business and are you actually turning a profit? Because I'd rather have a business that does 10 grand in sales, but five grand in profit every month than a yeah. hundred grand in sales and five grand in profit every month. Like right. it's way more stress to, uh, to have, you know, a lot of sales and, you know, one or two things can go wrong and wipe out your profit. Right. So, you, so you've been in the game for a long time. It might even be a decade, at least, where you have a YouTube channel. You've obviously been selling since high school, so a really long time. You've seen a whole bunch of people come and go. You've seen successful people stay. A lot of people fail. What are some of the, you know, one or two traits that you see time and time again? These are the traits that are inherently in the people who actually stay for the long haul. Man, I don't, uh, I will just say first, I've seen traits on both ends of the spectrum do incredibly well. I've met mm -hmm. with, uh, I met with a bookstore owner up in Michigan and I told him, I, I met with him just a few months ago. And I was like, yeah, we sold the company. He's like, what? He's like, I had no idea. He's like, I don't, I don't pay one bit of attention. He's like, I think I'm not even in any Facebook group or anything. I don't care. So his head is just down and he's running a fantastic business. Uh, he runs his own local bookstore. He sells on Amazon still. He's doing great. And he just doesn't pay attention. 
other really successful people I know are incredibly well networked. Like David has the pulse on so many sellers. He knows what's happening. He knows different business models that most people won't talk about, but they trust mm-hmm. David enough or he kind of you know, figures it out. So I've seen people that are successful that network really well. I've seen people that are successful that keep to themselves. Common traits, I would say you have to be measuring something. Uh, I yeah. definitely bias that direction, but you have to know your numbers. You have to know what, what your business is doing. If you don't know that, how do you know where you can improve? So I would say everybody that's successful has something they're tracking, even if it's not just dollars. It could be their time, it could be number of, of outbound phone calls, um, they, you know, they're, but they're, they're, they know what they're after. They've set up some way to measure it and, and they're doing it. So a little side plug for measuring stuff. So Caleb, you, you have a tracking spreadsheet that I know a lot of people have used and found great value in, especially if you're doing some sort of consignment. So can you tell us a little bit about that spreadsheet where people can find it, if there's possibly a discount code, stuff like that? Uh, you know, I, I still keep selling them. A few of them yeah. keep selling every single month. Yeah. Uh, Matthew redid the, the, the website. So if you go to defendthemargin.com, you can okay. check it out. Otherwise, I think down below. Three Colts bought our company. So I think it's still up there. Thebookflipper.com slash track, T-R-A-C-K. So it's just a, it's an accounting program for selling on Amazon. It integrates with Inventory Lab, Acceler List. Uh, actually, Turbo Lister from Scoutly, they integrate with it. A go to Lister, I believe, integrates with it. And we used to have a free listing software as well, free listing spreadsheet. Unfortunately, Amazon keeps changing things. So that that one's no longer viable. But you can list with, uh, oh, and I forgot, uh, what's Nathan Holmquist software? I don't know. Uh, it's another listing software. I've been out of the game so long, I can't remember. <laughs> Sorry, Nathan. But we integrate uh, Scan Lister. We integrate with them. Well. Lister, okay. So if you list any of your books, it basically you can pull them back in. You can pull your sales reports from Amazon. That's it. And then it just runs all sorts of great metrics. Uh, shows you what you're doing monthly. Shows you a, a income statement. Shows you a balance sheet. It really helps you get a, a pulse on things. And I use that for my consignment as well. So I use it to track my sources to know if the Goodwill on Third Street is doing better than the one on Main Street. Which one I should mm-hmm. go back to more often. I also use that to track consignment uh, sources and pay out my clients on a monthly basis. So that's a really good tool. Uh, I think bonus 50, B-O-N-U-S five zero will probably save you 50 bucks. So nice. I think that was still probably up and running. That's the only only part of my business that uh, Free Cold did That's not sad. buy. So if you want to support me still, you can't you can't use my software. I don't have any courses. But if you want to buy the tracking spreadsheet, that will you know pay for a couple of rounds of golf. So thanks awesome. to me. So we're, we are getting kind of towards the end. I do want to learn about the next steps. I'm fascinated because you're I mean, anyone listening to this knows that you're a highly intellectual person. Not only that, you take what you learn and put it into practice, which is probably the more important thing anyways, right? I know tons of people in my life who are very intelligent, but might not necessarily take the action steps to move forward. So action always, I think, you know, is what moves things forward. So someone who's very intellectual, very analytical, I mean, you, we all hear you talk in certain percentages and numbers, even for things as simple as like, you know, the average tour player drives the ball 299 yards, very specific, right? I'm curious. What are some of the things that you've been thinking about that have been going on in your head over this, you know, three, four, five, six months sabbatical in terms of what potentially might be down the road? Oh man, uh, yeah, just under. I'm just checking my stats. It is two ninety nine. So okay. wanted to wanted to make sure we're giving accurate information. <laughs> I, I I just love numbers. Uh, there there might be two percent autism there. I have no idea, but I I love numbers. They stick with me. Um, I can't remember that my wife likes extra salt on her hash browns from McDonald's, but I can remember you know random stuff. Fun fact, we were uh, flying, we we're going to come back from Idaho. We were seeing some college friends out there camping up at uh, Glacier National Park. And I always look at t-shirts. So when we're hiking, I'm looking at your shirt, your hat, looking for logos, going to make small talk based on whatever team I see. Uh, we actually found someone that was in the same missions organization as my wife um, because they had a shirt on and we ended up chatting on the trail for 20 minutes, which was incredible. We were in a coffee shop and uh, we were going to try, do you know who Trevor Hall is? He's a musician. I do not. I do not. Look him up. He's, he's okay. pretty good. He's on Spotify. Um, kind of folksy alternative. I'm not really sure, but um, really, really good music. Very, very good stuff for thinking of my life. Um, and I saw a guy grabbing coffee and the back of his shirt said Trevor Hall. And it turned around. It was like an artsy whatever shirt, but it didn't say Trevor Hall in the front. Uh-huh. And I just, you know, started chit-chatting. was like, hey, is that a Trevor Hall shirt? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, go to one of his shows like that. Like Alicia really wants to either go to Taylor Swift, Trevor Hall, or like Billy Rafool. And right. we were, we almost went to a, a Trevor Hall show this year and we just couldn't make it work. And, you know, he's like, yeah, 
uh, I was like, have you been to one of his shows? He's like, uh, I heard, I heard his, uh, his new violinist is really cool dude. And I'm like, what? He had a buddy with him. I thought he was like saying that was him. Well, it yeah. turns out it was himself. It was a new violinist. So he's been traveling with him. And like, so we just sat down and talked for 45 minutes. Wow. And it's super cool. His buddy like studied in Chile. Uh, they're both, both musicians, both had traveled quite a bit. And he was doing a show that night. So we ended up pushing our flights and went and watched a show just in a small wow. club. It was awesome. So okay. super cool guy. His name's Tim Snyder. You can check him out too. He's got some stuff on Spotify. But all that's because I noticed random shit. So um, <laughs> that's awesome. Just, just to plug the pay attention, be curious, ask questions. Cool. Um, what am I going to do next? Right now, I do want to get back into the business world. My wife's writing a book right now. So I'm, I'm trying to kind of help wipe all the kids. Make sure she has time to do that. Uh, once we sold the business, I kind of handed her the proverbial baton and said, "You're up." So <laughs> her turn to her turn to run with it a bit. So I'm I'm right. kind of taking a step back on purpose. Um, we'll get started again. We're going to do a podcast. Don't I'll, I'll, I'll say the name. It's going to be called Stacking Habits. You heard it here. Stacking, you know, stacking Habits dot com. Matthew and David are mad. I I released that. Oh well. Oh. So we're going to do that. We're going to talk about the habits that separate people. Um, and really the more habits you can stack, it's kind of a phrase in, in the tech world, we call it your tech stack. What are the building blocks that make your software? And so it's going to be essentially what's your habit stack. What are the things you do, uh, daily, weekly, monthly, uh, on a, on a rhythmic cadence? What are those things that, that you do that help you just decide, Hey, where am I aiming? What are my intentions? Am I actually doing things that are moving the ball forward toward those intentions and reflecting on that? And then what are you measuring? So we're going to talk about personal finance. We're going to talk about small business entrepreneurship. We're going to talk about health and wellness. We're going to talk about habits in general. Uh, it's kind of an open blank slate. We'll see what direction it goes. But I could see us buying a business, sharing that process uh, with other people that are curious about doing it. We'll probably start another software company. Uh, I think we're going to be transparent, share as much as possible just to kind of show people, here's how it works. Here's how to do it. Here's the challenges. Um, so we'll see. But uh, I'm excited to do it with Matthew and David. We do probably get our developer back. Um, the three Colts took him. They wanted him for three years. We negotiated down to one. Oh, wow. So okay. We still have non-competes. We can't compete in the Amazon space, which is fine. I think I think we're done done in that space anyway. Yeah. Um, but we do get our developer back in December. And I'm very excited to, to get him and uh, see what we can build together. Fascinating. I will absolutely be a viewer. So as soon as that is out... Um... I'll be all over that and uh, consuming that. So that's fascinating. Before we end off here, uh, I want to give a quote that I actually really love and then want you to also give your own quote since you read so much as well. So one of my favorite quotes has to do with action. It says, the best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago and the next best time is today. Uh, I'm curious, what is a quote that has really stuck with you from all of the reading that you've done over the years? And there's a, there's a lot. I, one, I, one I say quite a bit is uh, you're, you're the same person you were yesterday, except for the books you read and the people you meet. And so if you're not bringing in new ideas, it doesn't really do any good. You, you're not going to be able to do much with it. The other one is a book I just read. Have you heard of Dan Sullivan with Strategic Coach? I think I've heard of the name, but maybe not that last bit. Yeah. And I've, I've not, I don't know a lot about Strategic Coach. I know uh, Beardy Brandon, Brandon Turner with uh, Better Life Podcast, Brandon, remember, yeah. Dan, oh. the Deeper Pockets or Bigger, yep. bigger Pockets, Your one point. of them. He's in that group. There's a lot of, you know, really well-known people in that group. Maybe I'll join someday. I don't, I don't know how to get in. I'll have to go ask or probably write a big check. But he wrote a book called Who, Not How. Uh -huh. And the important thing is a lot of times we have problems that pop up. And the first thing we think of is, well, how can I solve this? Or how can I change my behavior to fix this? Or, or whatever. We always ask a how question. What that okay. does is it, it just puts the, the pressure on us to figure things out. He says, reframe that. Instead of asking, how do I get you know, in, in better shape? Or how can I work on my nutrition? Ask who. Who can help me get in shape? Who can help me learn how to eat better? Who can help me solve this business challenge? What that does is it just forces you to automatically go find an expert or outsource it and hire somebody. Uh, so it's a really interesting premise. The book was a, a quick read and, and in true form, he didn't write the book. He outsourced it to somebody else. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. So, and then they wrote, I think, three books together. So right. um, I just finished the second one. 10X is easier than 2X. But when it comes to solving problems, stop asking how and ask who. Cool. I'll look at your random one because I know that I bought the book. It's here somewhere. I'm trying to figure out where it is. I haven't cracked it open yet, but from your recommendation, uh, I bought the Yellow. Book. Avery's got my copy. He was at my house so and, could go and, and stole it. Very, very fascinating interview. I learned so much just from this one hour podcast. I want to say thank you so much for spending your time here because 
you know, even though you have the time now, you're also you're a very valuable person, and uh, I know you can be doing a bunch of uh, other stuff. You know, hanging out with your kids and, and your and your wife. So I just want to say thank you so much. Before we end, is there any way, any place people could connect with you if they want to maybe to reach out? Yeah, well, I appreciate you having me on, Joji. It's always good to connect. Uh, I was excited to come on. Uh, so yeah, thanks for making it a fun hour. If you want to connect, probably Instagram is going to be the easiest at okay. Caleb J Roth, just the letter J in the middle. Uh, that's me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a website, calebroth.com. I don't think it's active right now. I need to build that back out and uh, and kind of put some of my adventures up there. But Instagram is probably the easiest way. Um, and yeah, drop me a note. If you're ever in Indiana, I live close to Fort Wayne. Look me up, happy to play golf, grab coffee, just say hello. Uh, and I'm on the road a lot. Real quick, when you said that uh, you said I should come out and play golf, yeah. I've got a, a software tool. Did I mention Reflect last time you we connected? Did. You did not. So Reflect is an app. Um, I think it's reflect.ai is the website. Okay. Um, it's not free, but what it is, is it's just a daily log. So kind of like a bullet journal. You can you can build it however you want, but everything is kind of like its own Wikipedia page. So okay. I've got you tagged. Last time we chatted, I took a few notes about your family, about you know some of the things you told me about your goals. So I just, rather than just listen to it, forget about it, I just jotted a few things down. And so I've got a little note on you. And then what I do is I said, hey, Joji gave me a standing invite to come play golf in San Diego time That's good. rather than tag san diego so when oh, i'm going to wow. fly out to san diego next i'm going to just search my notes for san diego it's going to pull up anytime i mentioned it i'm like oh my gosh i forgot joji told me i need to come play golf you yeah. know so it allows you to sort of connect dots all over so i That's wish good. i had found this earlier it's a newer company um there's a lot of note apps out there i you know, i wish i was getting paid to promote this but reflect i believe if that ai is uh is awesome so check that out it's a really cool way to organize your thoughts um, I love being old school, writing in a journal, having a bullet notebook, all those things, but you can't search it. And so yeah. in today's day and age, if it's not on the computer, it's uh, it's not really out there. So awesome. everything's protected, secured. I've been really happy with it and uh, check it out. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. And everyone, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this interview podcast because I know I got immense value from it. But that's all I got for you today. Surely we'll have some other people on the channel, but uh, hope you all have a good one. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye. Thanks, Jody.